right, here we go, guys. So this is our next kind of major theme. Uh, we started to talk about the rise of Islam in the last couple of lectures. And now we're going to get into the first major dynasties in the Middle East. I really enjoy talking about this stuff, the Umayyad and the Abbasid dynasties. Uh, for your quiz, uh, you'll need to know, I'm going to break this up into a couple different videos, one on the Umayyad, one on the Abbasid. Only up to the Umayyad will you need for your first quiz, okay? The Abbasid stuff you'll obviously need for your midterm, uh, but uh, the Umayyad is the one that you'll need for, for the quiz, okay? Uh, so let me kind of set up what we're going to be doing with this. It should be kind of interesting. And as we see here, this is what I want you to know. There's these two dynasties. You need to know the rise of each dynasty. Obviously, what each one accomplished, what happened during their time period and power, what they did. Um, I will obviously give you information here, but there's also going to be information in your textbook, uh, especially for the Abbasid part in terms of a lot of their accomplishments. Um, I'm going to touch on it, obviously, in the next video, uh, but there's also stuff in your textbook that does a really nice job on that. And then what happened to each dynasty. So that's essentially kind of the objective, right? What I want you to be able to get out of, of listening to these next couple videos. All right, so I hope all that's clear, and we can go on with our first keywords and our map and talk about how the Maya dynasty comes about. So the first thing is we have this term that I hadn't given you before, I believe, the Ummah, and that's the Islamic community. It's the, the whole area under Islamic control. And you can see on our map here, everything you see in kind of in the, in the orange and the purple and all of that, these are all areas that are going to be under Islamic influence as we move into the 6 and 700s AD. So, and when you talk about the rise of the Umayyad, this family line that will be the dominant family uh, for a good over 100 years or so in the Middle East, how did that happen? Well, the first step for the Umayyads to be able to rule over a empire or a dynasty is that for it to become an empire physically. And so you need to look at how you have the expansion of the Ummah. How did the Islamic community go beyond the area of Mecca and Medina that we started with to encompass all these other areas in the Middle East, in North Africa, and even into Spain? So there are a couple important people we need to talk about, specifically the first couple caliphs. If you remember, I gave you the word caliph last time the leader of the Islamic community. And if you also remember last time, we had talked about how there was the Sunni and Shiites. So I think I gave you this name before, Abu Bak. He's the first key word you want to know there. And Abu Bak, he leads the Islamic community just for a couple of years. He fell, fell under the Sunnite uh, philosophy. And it was during his time that he expanded the Islamic community mainly up north into Syria region modern-day Syria, that whole area there. So that's primarily where Abu Bakr kind of expands the region to. He had a military general named Khalid. I didn't put his name there. It's okay if you don't know his name. Uh, but he was a very aggressive general, and apparently uh, he took his men 18 days, 500 men. They marched for 18 days up through the Syrian desert. Uh, they they drank the water from the the stomach of the camels to survive, uh, but using this very aggressive approach, he moves up into this area kind of in what is modern day Syria region, right? So kind of moving up northwards. So that's kind of the first bit of expansion under Abu Bakr. So you need to know him as the first caliph, um, and you also need to know him as the guy who begins to expand the, the Islamic community beyond Arabia, beyond the region of Mecca and Medina. And again, you have these maps in your textbook as well. They're not as colorful as these maps that I'm using here, uh, but they still kind of show you the time frame and where they're going and when they're going. All right, when he dies, he's going to be followed by Umar, and he's going to be Umar the second caliph, so you want to know that. Umar is described as being a very simple man. He's also going to be a Sunnite, right? Sunni. Uh, so he's a Sunnite as well. And very simple man, oftentimes wore with a heavy beard. He was said he was uh, pretty strict, he would go around the streets, kind of making sure everybody was following the Islamic laws. Um, and he's going to be aggressive as well. And he's going to add the regions of Mesopotamia, parts of Egypt, 
uh, sort of parts of the Persian Empire, parts of Egypt, all into the Islamic community. So a lot of the area you see in orange on this map here uh, represents the region that Umar is going to kind of expand to and control. So this needs to happen first. You can never, we'll get into the Umayyads themselves, but you can't have any sort of uh, rulership of, of a dynasty if you first don't have something to rule over. And that's why Abu Bakr and Umar are important. Uh, the other thing about Umar that's really significant is he creates a lot of wealth doing this, collects a lot of gold and silver, uh, so much so that he creates what is called the Dewan, which was kind of a, a public pension for uh, the soldiers especially, uh, so giving money to soldiers, things like that, that was something uh, that was a, a big part of what he did. He creates a law code as well, other than the Islamic law codes, where there's also just uh, other law codes that are created, uh, not too important. Uh, but then there's this other point that happens during under Umar that I definitely want you to know about. And as the Islamic community is growing, what happens to the people that are Muslims, right? Because this is going to be a very important topic throughout the history of the Middle East. Because while the majority of the people in much of the Middle East are Muslims, there are Christians and, of course, there is Jewish population. And what happens if you are of those religions, right? Sometimes they're called the people of the book in the Islamic community, right? In other words, they still practice a monotheistic religion, but they're not Muslims. And one thing that we see under Umar, and this is going to continue quite often under the Umayyads and other powers, the Ottomans later, is the use of what is called the jizya, very important term. And what that is, is a tax. And what the, usually, not always, but what usually happens when there is Islamic rule is that the people there who are Christians or Jewish are told by the Muslim leaders, you can practice your religion, you can maintain your Judaism, you can maintain your Christianity, we are not going to force you to convert. There were exceptions, and in Spain, for example, you were forced to convert or you die uh, under some rulerships of Islamic leadership, but it depended where you are. For the most part, practice your religion, do what you like to do, practice your faith, but you have to pay an extra tax. And that's the jizya, that you would pay an extra tax, so it was a tax on non-Muslims specifically for Jews and Christians. Um, so that, that, that was very important. It was one of the things that kind of allowed the Islamic community to spread in areas that aren't going to be completely Muslim. They, they, they're going to give them that. And then now, given that, were they all completely equal and all that? No. Uh, you know, for example, uh, during the time of Umar, there were rules that you could build a church. Um, well, technically, the rule was you can't build churches and you can't build synagogues. That was technically the rule. However, I did some more reading on this, and what I discovered is, well, you can for the right money, and if they were always smaller than the mosque in that area. So if, you know, technically you're not allowed to build a synagogue, you're not allowed to build a church, well, if you pay the, the, the leadership uh, enough money, you can, but it still has to be smaller. So they were workarounds, apparently, that. So this is kind of an interesting idea. We're going to see this a lot more when we get to the Ottoman Empire later on, uh, as the, the, as especially under the Ottomans, when they start moving into much more Christian-controlled area, things will get very interesting. For now, it's kind of a smaller issue because, again, the majority, the vast majority of people living there are Muslims anyways. So those are the first couple people you need to know, Abu Bakr and Umar. They're very important. First Caliph, second Caliph. They expand the Islamic community. Opening up everything for the Umayyads to take over under the third Caliph. So Uthman is the third Caliph. Here are the key words associated with him. And he's the third caliph, and he has the family dynasty known as the Umayyads. So if you remember, Abu Bakr and Umar, they're not, they're not related. Uthman's not related either. But what we're going to have now after this is the leaders of the, the area of the Middle East are basically going to be people from Uthman's family, the Umayyad family. So this is why we call it kind of the first dynasty. But you need to know the other things for this to happen. So Uthman, um, you know, one of the important things he does is he writes down the Quran. That's one of his most significant achievements. I think we talked about that before, is that when Muhammad received the revelation, it wasn't written down. Under Uthman, it will be written down. So that's important. 
um, you know, he's going to still have pretty firm control of all the region I just showed you in the previous map there. Uh, so Egypt, modern-day Iraq region. Uh, he makes Damascus as kind of his center, and that's one of the things we see under the Umayyads, uh, is they make kind of Damascus the center of the Islamic community. So what started before in Mecca, then Medina, then Mecca, now it's Damascus that becomes the center under Umayyad rulership. So those are a few things you need to know about Uthman. He gets the family dynasty going, he writes down the Quran, and the other really important event during the time of Uthman is the conflict you're really going to start to see with the Shiites. So it is during the reign of Uthman that the conflict gets intense. And in fact, Uthman is killed in 656. Apparently he was either stoned to death or beaten to death. I've read a couple different accounts of this. Uh, but he is going to be killed and he in, in the Islamic community that are the Sunnis are going to blame the Shiites for this. They say this was a Shiite plot uh, that had him killed. Um, and so this is something that's going to resonate for a long time in the Middle East, this conflict between the Sunnis and the Shiites. Now when Uthman is killed, he has an uncle. His uncle here is named Muawiyah. And immediately, Muawiyah says, all right, well, I am now the new leader of the Umayyad family, which he did become, but he also declares himself the Caliph. The problem is not everyone acknowledged him as the Caliph. He is going to try to kind of maintain the rule of Caliph in the city of Damascus. However, Ali, if you remember, all right, so here's Ali. Ali, who is the son-in-law of Muhammad, he claims to be the fourth caliph, and he's actually usually acknowledged as the fourth caliph, and he's going to claim that center in Kufa, it's a city in Iraq. And so this is where you really see during the Umayyad period, this conflict between the Shiites and the Sunnis being very intense. Uh, so Ali claims to be the leader of the Islamic community in what is the city of Kufa. Muawiyah claims to be the leader of the Islamic community center from Damascus. And there are a lot of conflicts. In fact, Ali in 661, as you can see there, is going to be killed um, in, in the fighting between the Sunnis and the Shiites. Remember, Ali is a Shiite. And then Ali had a son named Hussein. He is going to be killed in another conflict in the year 680. So what we see is definitely the Umayyads under Muawiyah and other people after Muawiyah, I'll give you a couple more names as we go forward, are the ones that are the dominant force in the Middle East, right? They are going to be the dominant force. However, the Shiite conflict is now bloody, it's brutal, and you're going to consistently see this. You are going to end up as a result of this with the Shiites kind of being more in the East areas like modern day Iran, and the Sunnis dominating much of the rest of the region. Remember I said in the other lecture, it's going to be the Sunni that are going to be the dominant. But that is definitely one of the things you want to know that happens during the Umayyad period is the whole conflict between the Shiites and the Sunnis. So again, it's also be pretty clear all the, all the terms here are up there for you uh, in case you forget. All right, good. So I hope all that's clear. All right, so now there's more stuff on the Umayyads. So what else do the Umayyads do? So on this map, it's a little closer up. So again, you can kind of see all the stuff we're talking about here. Uh, so Damascus is where they started, right? Here is modern day Iraq. Uh, and here's Egypt, of course. And the Islamic community is spread to control much of this region. Muawiyah, one more thing about him, so between 661 and 680, he had obviously the conflict with the Shiites, as we just mentioned, but the other thing about Muawiyah is he also wants to expand in other areas. One area he wanted to expand into is the Byzantine Empire. So what is the Byzantine Empire? I think I mentioned them briefly, you do want to know this. So the Roman Empire falls in the year 476 AD, right? So that's when the Roman Empire goes bye-bye, 476 AD. All of this area was, I think I showed you in the other map, one of them was under the control of the Roman Empire. Roman Empire goes bye-bye. The eastern part of the Roman Empire survived. It's called the Byzantine Empire. It's everything you see on this map in green. And the Byzantine Empire was fairly strong in the 600s, 700s, 800s, 900s, 1000s, right? 
during those years, they were pretty powerful. In fact, the Byzantine Empire is going to go on until 1453. So they last another thousand years after the Roman Empire falls. And you could see they border the Islamic world there. And Muawiya actually tries to fight against them. Uh, he tries, he fails. Uh, one of the reasons he failed is the Byzantine Empire were very advanced. One of the things they developed, and I'll share a cool picture of this in a second in the next slide, is something called Greek fire. Um, and uh, Greek fire is this kind of interesting oil that burns on water. And so the Byzantines would use that to fend off any, any naval attacks uh, against them, and it was very effective. Uh, but this is also in the infancy of the Islamic world. It's the infancy of the Umayyad period. And so it was a bit of a stretch for them to go after the Byzantine Empire in an effective way. Uh, but this is going to be a long-running conflict between the Muslim powers and the Byzantine Empire. Uh, and this is really where it starts. Now, even though Muawiya was not able to do take any sort of significant land of the Byzantine Empire, he was able to move further through North Africa. And you can kind of see on this map the sweeping in through North Africa. Uh, that's going to happen as well under Muawiya and also under the reign of Yazid I. Yazid I is another uh, Umayyad uh, leader, and he is also responsible. The only thing you need to know about Yazid I, you can see he only rules for a few years. You don't need to memorize the dates, as always, uh, but he's responsible for continuing the expansion through North Africa. So those are a couple other things you definitely want to know about the Umayyads in terms of their conflict with the Byzantine Empire and further expansion through North Africa. This is the Greek fire, uh, pretty cool little uh, image of it. Uh, and you can see kind of how the flames would go onto the boats and apparently would burn uh, on water. It's, I, I don't know the science behind it, but apparently it's pretty cool. All right, we move on. All right, so now what? Well, the next part of our story under the Umayyad period is when the Umayyads moved into Spain. So during the reign of Walid al-Walid I, right, you can see his dates there, so we're jumping ahead a bit, the Umayyads had now moved into Spain. Now, this is where things get more intense with the West. What's going on here? What are we looking at on this map? So I just talked about how the Roman Empire ended in the year 476 AD. When the Roman Empire ended, you don't need to know everything on this map here, by the way, uh, that's for my History 110 class, you had these various Germanic tribes that conquered the western part of Rome. Uh, the Franks conquered what is the area of modern-day France. Uh, another Germanic tribe known as the Lombards conquered Italy. But one of the tribes known as the Visigoths, and it gets cut off here a little bit on this image, the Visigoths, they conquered Spain. So these are Germanic tribes that conquered the Roman Empire around the 400s. And so they're, 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 so they're weak, they're small, they're Germanic tribes, it's not an empire, they're all independent, um, they're not very strong, um, and so that happened in the 400s. And the Vis Visigoths were never a very powerful civilization. And so by the time we get to the 700s, under the Umayyad rule, the Islamic powers move and conquered Spain. They defeated the Visigoths and conquered Spain. All right, so that was how the Islamic community begins to move into that area. It was during the Umayyad period. At that point, technically, yes, it's the Umayyads who control Spain, but another important term you need to know are the Moors. Sometimes we call the Muslims in Spain the Moors. So you might open up a textbook and it'll talk about the Umayyads in Spain. You might open up something and it talks about them as the Moors, right? So the, the Muslims in, in Spain are the Moors. That's, how, that's a term. Now, they're not done because then they want to move further north. And as they take over Spain, early 700s, and then as we move into about 732, they move up north further. And they move up north, and they fight against another Germanic tribe known as the Franks, all right? The Germanic tribe known as the Franks, who at the time had a very powerful military man named Charles the Hammer. That was his nickname, Charles the Hammer. And there's this big battle between Charles the Hammer and the Moors, the Muslims who were in Spain who were trying to move further north, uh, called the Battle of Tours. It's in what is modern-day France. A very big battle. And at this battle, Charles the Hammer is victorious. 
why does this matter? Well, this is the first time the Islamic community under the Umayyads, the Moors, in this case, were stopped. Up to now, remember, they, they had moved all the way from the Middle East, through Egypt, through North Africa, through Spain, but then they get stopped by the Franks, specifically Charles the Hammer. So this is not a great success uh, during the Umayyad period. But it's still, you know, they, they're able to, to maintain everything else. Uh, you know, it, it's hard to move into that far away from your base. As, as much as the Umayyad family did, that was a bit of a stretch to get all the way into that area. I always think it's amazing they got into control of Spain. So they did do that. Um, the other thing we see with the Umayyads is that we'll, we'll move a little bit further eastward. As far east as they move is something called the Oxus River. Uh, you don't need to worry about that so much. I don't even have it on the map there. Uh, but the Oxus River is another area that they moved into further east. Okay. Uh, so anyways, that's the expansion into Spain and other areas. All right. So I hope all that is clear. Next, other couple other things I want to talk about the Umayyad. So these are all still stuff under the Umayyad period in the 700s. During the Umayyad period, they continued the jizya, which of course is the um, tax on non-Muslims. And another really important event that happened under the Umayyad period is the slave trade from Africa. You know, a lot of people, when they think of slave trade from Africa, immediately think 1700s. Uh, triangle trade system, you know, that, that period of time. Well, this happened a lot earlier, and it was during the Umayyad period that we believe in the 8th century alone, uh, what you're seeing in this image is slave trade. You're seeing the Umayyads move into Africa and starting to purchase slaves uh, from, from the people there, and there were about 300,000 slaves in Africa taken uh, by the Umayyad period. So that's an important point as well under the Umayyad era. All right, now this is fun. So one of the other biggest accomplishments of the Umayyads is architecture. And one of my favorite places that I've been to um, is this place called Cordoba. I've been to Spain, and honestly, I've, I've been to Greece, I've been to Italy, I've been to Israel, I've been to France, I've been to so many places, and I've been to Spain. And I'll, I'll be honest, of all the places I was at, Spain was my least favorite, with the exception of this amazing place called Cordoba. So Cordoba, this was built as a result of the Umayyads moving into the area of Spain. It is a magnificent city. It was built in the 700s. Uh, what you're looking at is an aerial view of a mosque that they built. And it's, it's a very interesting architecture because it was a church. First it was a Visigoth church. Then they built a big mosque around it. And then they added a church to it again. And very often in history, when one civilization conquers another, they just kind of demolish what was there and then they um, build over it. That didn't happen at the Cordoba Mosque. Instead, it was a church, they added a mosque, then they added another church. And so you walk through it, I'm going to show you some pictures in a second when I was there, and it's just trippy. It's one of the, the most amazing buildings I've ever seen. I've seen a lot of buildings uh, because you're walking through one corner, you turn a corner, and you'll see it looks from a mosque to a church in a t t as a turn of a corner. It's really neat. Uh, but the city itself is magnificent. It had 100,000 people in it. It had this beautiful mosque. Uh, it had 300 baths, kind of public baths. It had a library that had 400,000 volumes of work in it. Um, and this is all during the time where the rest of Western civilization is in the quote unquote dark ages, uh, which is really interesting because again, that, that after Rome falls, much of Western Europe is in this dark age period. There isn't much writing, there isn't much science, there isn't much architecture. You don't see anything this huge being built <clears throat> in the four, five, six, seven hundreds inside of Europe. Uh, but this is what's created in Spain because of the Umayyad family. So Cordoba is a, gr a great example of some amazing architecture that was built under the Umayyad period. And there's a lot of influence there as well. And I'm going to butcher this, but if any of you speak Spanish, uh, there's a phrase in Spanish, ojala. Um, and I know I'm not saying it well, uh, but it, it means, I think, to God or um, something of that nature. Or, or um, and it's actually 
You're saying, O oh, Allah, O oh, Allah in terms of the Islamic God. But it's an expression in Spanish today, just to show you the how how it's how it, that that culture got intertwined with the Spanish culture. The Islamic culture got intertwined with the Spanish culture. So let me show you some more images of Cordoba. So this is just an aerial view. I have some pictures when I was there. So this is kind of the inside of Cordoba. It's got these famous arches, and this is the mosque part. This is another image of the mosque part of it. The columns, another, I forgot to mention this, uh, but when they built the columns of Cordoba, as I mentioned, it was a church, it was a mosque, it was then a church again, and it's built with Roman columns that they found left over. And this is a close-up picture I took. And so some of the columns are more modern, uh, they had from the time. Some, they just found, oh, this is a good old Roman column, we'll just use that. And so y'all, on top of having all these um, other elements of it, of being an early ch Visigoth church, and then being a mosque, then being a modern church, it also has some Roman architecture in there as well. So it's, a, it's like being a little kid in a candy store when you walk in there from a history perspective. So I, I like that picture. These are the Visigoth ruins. So this is looking down as you walk in Cordoba. If you look underground, you could see the, 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 the ruins of the original Visigoth church that was there, which was tiny. And then they built right over it and around it, uh, the mosque. And this is in Cordoba. And you look at this image and go, wait a second, this looks like a church. And it looks like a church you would see in, in Italy or something. Uh, with the cathedrals and everything. It is, um, and it, it's where they started to add the church to the mosque. Um, so that's pretty cool. And here is, in the background, you could see a Christ figure, right? There's the Christ figure. And in the foreground, you still see the transition from the mosque to the church. So Cordoba is a pretty cool little city. Um, if you ever go to Spain, definitely, you know, I would make that one of the big places to go to. You know, when people travel very often, they go to these big cities, Barcelona, Madrid, London, Paris. My thing is always go outside those big cities. Some of the best stuff is outside the big cities. All right, so those are a few images of Cordoba. And one more bit of architecture under the Umayyad period. They were the ones who also built the Dome of the Rock, which I think, of course, we talked about in the previous lecture. This is built in Jerusalem. This was what was built right on top of Solomon's Temple. So as you can see, the Umayyads were pretty busy, right? You know, they did a lot. They, they, they conquered a lot of area. Uh, some of it was conquered, you know, under uh, some people of the first couple caliphs. They had some conflict with the Shiites. Uh, they had some architectural achievements. They had some economic points we talked about. So definitely all of that is material you want to know about the Umayyad period. Um, you know, there's a little bit more in your textbook, but it covers them pretty thoroughly. So the question is, what happened to the Umayyads? How did the Umayyads lose power? And how did the Abbasids take over? And we will talk about that in our next lecture. All right, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you.